Hello, this is the first in a series of recordings on screening designs. We've already introduced this topic through the use of fractional factorials and in the next few videos we're going to expand upon it and talk about a lot of what I'm going to refer to as modern types of experimental designs. And as usual before watching this video you should have watched the um, previous videos that I did on fractional factorials and you should have read the notes on screening designs part one and in fact at this point screening designs part one and two would be helpful so do recall in our um, previous discussion we we spent some time on these 2 to the k minus p fractional factorial designs. That is, we take a full 2 to the k factorial, we split it in half some number of times, and in that way we can run an ex a smaller experiment. And usually people refer to these smaller designs as screening, simply meaning uh, we have a lot of factors, we don't want to do a lot of runs, and we hope to be able to eliminate or screen out some factors so we can focus on a smaller set. But remember, one of the issues of the 2 to the k minus p designs is this idea of complete confounding or aliasing. That is, it's impossible for us to separate the impact of some of the effects on the response. That is, confounded or alias means we have two or more effects that are perfectly correlated. So there's no way to separate their effects. And furthermore, we talked about what is called a resolution 3 fraction and a resolution 4. Recall a resolution 3 means a design where each main effect is aliased with one or more two-way interactions. We really don't like these designs because main effects and two-way interactions commonly occur and with these designs we can't really separate their effects. On the other hand, resolution four designs uh, are actually uh, a fairly nice designs, but in these designs two-way interactions are aliased with other two-way interactions but not with main effects. So basically a resolution for uh, fra fractional factorial is a nice design to begin with. But again, we have the problem of complete aliasing. There is just no way to separate out the confounded effects. Okay. And what happens next, we can get this to work. There we go. Okay. And one of the things we learn about these um, factorial designs, the 2 to the k or 2 to the k minus p designs, are that all of the effects that we can estimate are what we call orthogonal. What do we mean by orthogonal? Well, what we mean is that they're uncorrelated. Orthogonal comes from the uh, war, uh, term in geometry at right angles. So if you think of each effect as a column in a uh, what I'm going to call a model table, if they're orthogonal, they're at right angles to each other, the columns, and there's no correlation. Now this has some nice advantage because it means I can independently estimate each effect. So if you take a look on uh, the current slide in front of you, you'll notice on the left is a design that we've estimated, and it has a two-way interaction. On the right, I removed the two-way interaction. Notice the main effect estimates did not change. They're orthogonal to the two-way interaction. So this is a nice property, but it comes at some expense in terms of the size of designs. Okay. So if we go to the next slide, okay. notice that 
we have a design where the main effects are orthogonal but they're not orthogonal to two-way interactions. So notice carefully, okay, we have the two-way interactions of E and F and F of G. They are not orthogonal to the main effects. We remove them, look to the right, notice the main effects changed. So this is what happens when you have non-orthogonality, meaning I can't completely decouple the estimate of the main effects from the two-way interactions with which they are partially aliased. So even though orthogonality may seem ideal, the idea to independently estimate each effect, as I said, you'll see that there is a big trade-off in cost, and we often are very happy using designs with some amount of non-orthogonality. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time on these types of designs. Okay. And on the next slide, notice these are just correlation tables. And you'll notice, if you take a look at the table, you know, the two-way interactions are indeed correlated with the main effects. So just as a matter of interest, we take a look at the correlations. Okay. But if we take the main effects out, notice that uh, with the two-way interactions removed, the main effects are uncorrelated. Interestingly, because of the correlation of the main effects, okay, to the two-way interactions. If the two-way interactions are in the model, the ability to orthogonally estimate the main effects is also impacted. So this is, again, one of the interesting properties of these, um, what I'll call non-orthogonal designs. It's important to understand it, but again, you're going to see that unless the uh, lack of orthogonality is severe, there are some definite advantages to these types of designs. Okay. So, let's talk a little bit about an important concept called a model matrix, and I've made reference to it. Well, when you create your design, okay, and you get the table with the runs in it, we just call it the design matrix. So I create a 2 to the 3rd or a 2 to the 4th minus 1. I get a table, it gives you the settings of the main effects, and then there's a column for the response. However, when you create the model, you now require an extra column in the data table to, that allows you to estimate each of the model terms. So this expanded data table is often referred to as the model matrix. You don't see this. Good modern statistical software create this matrix in a background. There's no real need that you actually need to see all these additional columns that have been added to the table. But without this model matrix, uh, we literally could not actually estimate the effects. Okay. 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 So just to give you an example on slide 14, in the upper right hand corner is a 2 to the 3rd design. It has 8 trials. If you look below, you'll see the model matrix. It has an intercept uh, column, so it needs a column of ones. This is for the intercept in the model. It has the main effects, and then the key point, it's now added these additional terms that account for the interactions that have been added to the model. So this expanded table we would refer to as the model matrix. Again, in modern statistical software, you would not even see this table. It all takes place in the background. Okay. 
So you'll see in a moment why that idea of a model matrix is important. But I first want to introduce the concept of partial aliasing. So in the 2 to the k minus p, in 2 to the k designs, two effects are either orthogonal or they're completely aliased. But in many designs, there's a middle ground between these two states. And we often refer to this as partial aliasing. That is, the effects aren't entirely equal to, to each other, but they're partially equal. Another way of saying it is, they're not completely correlated, but they're partly correlated. So in creating many of the modern screening designs, we will not have this idea of full aliasing, but we still have to deal with partial aliasing. In other words, I can't completely separate the effects, but I can still actually estimate each of the two effects separately, accepting that those estimates will be correlated. Okay, so if effects are partially aliased, we have to accept the fact that they are necessarily correlated. Again, if they were fully aliased, the correlation would be 1 or minus 1. But in many cases, with partial aliasing, the correlation isn't actually all that big. And we're going to learn later how to find out what the partial aliasing is um, using jump, actually. Okay. So there are a couple of implications for having uh, terms in a model that are partially alias that we need to discuss. Okay. First, if you have partially aliased effects in the model, okay, then their estimated effects are correlated. Okay. Second, if we do have partial alias effects and some of those effects are not included in the model, then the effects of the estimates that are still in the model may be biased, and I'm going to show you an example of that in a little bit. Okay. And again, the amount of correlation or bias depends upon the level of what we call partial aliasing. So it may appear in the end that orthogonal designs may be desirable because there is complete independence of the effects. However, the trade-off is these designs typically are too big and cost too much money to run. Okay. So I've introduced the idea of the model matrix. This is the expanded table where we've added columns for each of the effects we want to estimate in the model in addition to the main effects. Well, related to that is the idea of an alias matrix. So let's think about a 2 to the 4th factorial. So a 2 to the 4th fourth factorial, it's easy for me to say, okay, it has, as you know, 16 trials. And if I create the full factorial model, then we have the following elements of the model matrix or model table. An intercept term, four main effects, six two-way interactions, four three-way interactions, and one four-way interaction. In other words, a total of 16 effects to be estimated. So on slide 18, this is a picture of what the model matrix looks like. Again, if you were creating this design and doing the work, what you would see is this portion. All the other terms of this model matrix are added in the background. And unless you specifically ask Jump to see the uh, model matrix, it won't be shown to you. Okay, all good modern statistical software just creates these additional columns and there's not an explicit reason why the user needs to see them. But this model matrix, one of its important 
uh, uses is it leads us to something that we refer to as the alias matrix. Okay. So I'm not going to get into a full discussion of an alias matrix. We have informally introduced the idea. But think of it this way. I start with my original model matrix. Think about the 2 to the 4th example on the previous slide. Okay. But then I decide I don't want to estimate all of the 16 potential effects, including the intercept. I want to remove some terms from the model. So as a result, what we're going to end up with, okay, obviously, is a reduced model matrix. And the reduced matrix just has the columns for the effects that I want to estimate in the model. Okay. So I've got the reduced model matrix. Then I've got another matrix for the terms I've removed. So we've taken the original full model matrix and broken up into two parts. A reduced model matrix and another matrix containing the terms that I have decided to eliminate. Okay. And this is where we get what we call the alias matrix. So again, I'll use my simple 2 to the 4th example. So remember, the full model matrix had 16 columns. But suppose I've decided to eliminate all three-way interactions and the four-way interactions okay, from the model. So on your left is the new model matrix. On the right is the matrix of terms that I have omitted. I've removed them from the model. And of course, I'm hoping those terms I removed all have zero effect on the response. In other words, hopefully we removed only terms that have no effect on our response. Okay. So once we decide to remove the terms from the model, and again, I will not delve deep into the, the linear algebra. It's not required for the course. I could take my original model and rewrite it. And how I would actually rewrite it, I'm going to call one part of it x1. So x1 are the terms I've kept in the model, plus the intercept. And beta1 are the coefficients corresponding to the terms I kept in the model. But there's a second portion. Okay. These are the terms I've taken out of the model. Okay. So think of this x2 as a part of the model that has been removed. In other words, I've taken it out. And typically when we do this, we're making an explicit assumption that, uh, that all of the terms in that matrix X2 have zero effect. In other words, that's my justification for just removing that part of the model. So we take these terms out of our model. But what if some of those terms that I took out of the model that are in this new table x2, what if they have a non-zero effect? Well, that can actually cause some problems for the model that I'm actually fitting. Okay? And to show what those problems are, I have to introduce the concept of the alias matrix. And Jump provides these. I know some of you have already seen them in the output. And I won't get into the algebra of it. But the alias matrix shows the partial aliasing between terms that are in your model and terms you've removed from the model. Okay. Potentially, I should say potentially removed. And notice, if the terms we remove, this uh, table with the x2 columns, if those effects were all truly zero, then actually we wouldn't have a problem because then, given they're all zero effects, the aliasing would not occur. But theoretically, this matrix A is important because this matrix shows us the potential aliasing between terms in the model and terms we did not include in the model. 
And I am going to start having you focus on reading the Hoos and Jones book on optimal experimental design. And for those of you who are interested in learning more about the alias matrix, there's a nice discussion of it on pages 27 through 32. Okay. It's not hard, but if you haven't had prior background in uh, linear algebra, uh, it can be difficult to read, so I do not assign it, I just simply point it out to you that it's there. But the concept of the alias matrix is important and the concept of partial aliasing. Okay. So here's an example. Remember the 2 to the 4th factorial. Okay. I removed all the 3-way interactions and the 4-way this would form the columns of this matrix X2. Now what I want to know is how might the terms I remove from the model be alias with the terms that I retained and this is in the table X1. Well jump can, will generate the alias matrix for you in a number of the DOE platforms and take a look at it on slide 23 and you'll see 0. Meaning, if I remove any terms from this model because the design is completely orthogonal, I will not bias or, in other words, say alias any of the effects in the model I fit. Again, this may seem the ideal scenario, but in reality, uh, orthogonality typically comes at a heavy price in terms of size and cost of your experiment. Okay. Now I'll show you another example. This is actually something called a Plackett-Berman design that I'll speak to. Here's a design where the main effects are orthogonal. However, they're partially aliased with many of the two-way interactions. So notice that we get these entries, these plus and minus one-third entries. What that tells you if that effect, let's pick an example just to illustrate for you. Okay, let's pick the column AB. Okay, so we look down the column and we look at the rows and notice the aliasing with some of the main effects. And, the, and this aliasing represents a bias and it could be positive or negative. That says if AB is not in the model, in other words, I've put it over in the uh, X2 table, and it actually has an effect. In other words, it has a non-zero impact on the response. Then when I estimate main effects C through G, they will be biased by one-third of whatever the effect of AB might be. So notice in fact, that every main effect is aliased with a two-way interaction not involving that main effect. This is a property of what we call Plackett-Berman designs, <clears throat> and enough of these two-way interactions are significant that we're actually in a good deal of trouble in terms of getting highly biased effects.